Yeah. So I'll, I'll get kick off. Um, thanks, David, for the kind introduction. Um, yes, uh, so I'm um, Director of Stakeholder Engagement for Queensland at MTP Connect. Thank you. Um, we, I've been in the role for about 18 months and I uh, previously was at Medicines Australia. Before that, I was a pharmacist. I worked at the Marsa Hospital for a very long time, about 12 odd years. So, um, so I'm excited by the Brady Fellowship Program because what I found when I moved from a clinician role at a hospital into industry and, and the policy and advocacy work that it was doing, we were obviously worked very closely with with big companies. And what I found was just the generosity of time and the commitment of people within industry. And, and we are all after the same thing. We all want what's best for patients. And that's what healthcare is all about. And that's why I'm enthusiastic about Ready because it links. I think industry can sometimes look like it's kind of inaccessible and it's, and it's really not. And part of my role and our stakeholder engagement team's role is to to increase that access and facilitate that access and bring bring you all together in the in the ecosystem as as one i guess you could put it so yes but before i go into the reddish um, fellowship program i need to talk to you a bit about mtp connect if i can oh is it can we get off the notes don't know how to do that okay we, well we might just go back then and yeah, that's what I thought. You do? So I can't do it? Well, that's going to be interesting. Okay. That's all right. People are used to reading. Oh, that's all right. No, no, that's fine. Um, Okay, so MTP Connects uh, is the industry growth centre for the medtech, the biotech and the pharmaceutical sector in Australia. And we have the aim of accelerating the rate of growth of that sector here. So we um, were formed in 2015, I think, um, as part of the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources Industry Growth Centre Initiative. Um, there's six growth centres altogether, of which we represent the MTP sector. So we work in four different ways to um, accelerate the rate of the growth of the sector here. So the first way is to increase collaboration and commercialization across the sector. We also work to improve management and workforce skills, um, to improve access to global supply chains and international markets. And also we work to optimize the regulatory environment. And this, um, uh, this slide is a good representation of all the different stakeholders we work with to, to try and achieve our, our goals. So we've got regulators, investors, universities, governments, industry associations, researchers, and uh, companies as well. So we do this in three separate ways. We're, firstly, we're an independent voice. So um, MTP Connect's not a membership organization. So we are seen as an independent and trusted voice. We can, and we can make um, recommendations to government um, based on stakeholder feedback. And, and we do a lot of work around that workshops, um, industry engagement, um, engagement with, with uh, universities and researchers as well. So we also take direct action and that's largely through um, delivering education events and supporting programs that will deliver those events as well. Um, and we've got a strategic funding arm as well. So we were formed with a $15.6 million um, grant, I guess, from DISA. And, um, and, and so we deliver that through projects that we, we think are worthy to accelerate the rate of growth here as well as um, through our MRFF projects as well. Um, as part of our independent voice, we publish reports. So we consult widely with the sector, as I mentioned, and, um, and, and we come up with, and it's kind of fits in with our optimizing the regulatory environment as well. So this um, slide shows a number of our, our publications they're all downloadable on our website, but we take a we, we take a, a local and a global view with these um, publications as well. You can see that we've got a, 
couple of publications on the um, on the markets in India and as well as Indonesia. Um, we've got and and we did a really interesting report last year on the impact of COVID. A series of reports on the impact of COVID because we all know how that's affected what we all do. Um, it's an, yeah, they're a really good read actually. Um, we've got a great report on fighting superbugs on antimicrobial resistance and, um, and we've done some extra work on that since that report as well, which I'll tell you about in a minute. And, um, and also we've got our sector competitiveness plan. So this is a really important report, the sector competitiveness plan. Um, one of the other things that we do at MTB Connect in, this, um, in the stakeholder engagement team is uh, we were asked to review grant applications as well for the government. So, and quite often we'll, what we'll see is, is when we're assessing a grant, um, it will say, how does your grant and your project align with the sector priorities as outlined by the Industry Growth Centre? And how does it align with the emerging mega trends, which are outlined in the sector competitiveness plan, the knowledge priorities, and the, that's all outlined in the sector competitiveness plan. And, and the other thing that through our engagement that we'll do is we're happy to discuss those with you when, when you're preparing an application to say, just, you know, we, we can talk about it. You can pick up the phone, call me, my phone number's on, on the internet. So um, I'm very happy to have those discussions. So it is, it's an important read, um, yeah, because it, it aligning with that competitiveness plan is, is, a, is certainly a factor. So I wanted to touch on a, a, a bit of a favourite of mine, um, along with the Fighting Superbugs report. Um, we released last week an update of our clinical trials sector snapshot. So this is a report that is often used and often um, referred to, especially in industry, to demonstrate the value of the clinical trial sector here because it is very valuable and, and there's some interesting figures on the next slide, I think, that demonstrates that value. When, when we launched it, we had Carrie Bloomfield from GSK. She heads up um, GSK's clinical trials and, um, and she said the same thing. We refer to this a lot. It's a, it's a, really, it's a really good report. So this is the snapshot. So $1.4 billion was spent on clinical trials in 2019. That was up uh, about 5% from our first report, um, which I think it was 2015. Um, we employ 8,000 jobs in the sector. Again, that was up. This is the middle figure the, of patient participation is a new figure in this report. Um, 95,000 patients participating in clinical trials and given what clinical, what value clinical trials brings to not just the country economically, but to patients. Uh, I think that's a really amazing figure. I think that's fantastic. So there was 1,880 trials started in 2019. So that again, up from 2015. Um, interestingly, about a third of those were non-industry um, sponsored trials, so investigator led trials. But um, when we go back to the $1.4 billion spend, about 80% of that spend came from industry. So yeah, inter interesting mix of, of, of figures on that one. And this last figure is the one that I particularly like, and that's 5% um, of global um, industry sponsored trials. That's our market share. I'll just move that. I think that's amazing. And I think that's amazing because Australia is about 1% of the global healthcare market, yet we have a 5% share of the clinical trials market. I think that is it just, it's a, a, a great reflection of just how good we are, how good our researchers are and our facilities are, how, how, um, how uh, strong our data is that we that we export because it essentially it is an export it's an export industry clinical trials we're exporting our data so it's it, we are very well respected and we have um, good policies and schemes in place to to um, to to encourage clinical trials in Australia and um, and and obviously we can always make it better and get better and we, we are in the in the report um, does highlight some ways that we can try and do that and and make the ecosystem and make the environment stronger for to conduct clinical trials here. But 
That's to me is really impressive. Five percent share of global sponsored trials. So, and this is a, just a quick snapshot on the trials by phase. So that's growth. The percentage figure is growth between 2015 and 2019. So obviously, phase one and phase two were doing really well, growing those those two um, phases of clinical trials. Uh, phase three and phase four, uh, we, we're holding our own in that. We're not we're not really going. You know that. It is a minus figure, but essentially we're we're holding our own in that. It's not, you know, for one of a. You know, it's probably not. No, I'm no statistician, but it probably doesn't fall within the the what, what is, what's the what's the term? Six, 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 six. Thank you, David. <laughs> and devices, obviously, we're, and we've seen a rise in device trials as well. So it's a, it's a really good report. As I say, I used it a lot in previous roles, and I, I, I'm sure I'm going to be referring to it a lot as well in, in, in the role that I have at the moment. So I mentioned a bit about engagement and the, and the direct action um, kind of role that we take as well. But um, So this slide shows that some of the things we do. So... Uh, the tile for the adaptive regulation for digital health, a pathway for industry that was held back in March. That was to launch a report that was um, co-authored by UQ. And we were lucky to have um, Lisette Prigel, who um, was part of that webinar, as well as um, Syro, Rob Grenfell, Bronwyn LeGrasse from Man Health, and Helen Soros, the CEO of Cardihab, who was featured in that report. That was good. It was it it, it highlighted the the regulatory pathway and the need to think about regulation when you're doing when you're trying to commercialize something think about the regulatory pathway um and our podcast obviously our podcast is really well received it's we we do a regular podcast we talk to key opinion leaders in the sector um and we put them out pretty regularly that's it's widely listened to i think in about I, I might have heard 50 odd countries. I think we've had people listening to our podcast. So, so it, it's, it's fantastic. Some great conversations. We have spoken to lots of people, like Queenslanders as well. We had um, Ian Henderson um, and Kate Schroeder recently as well, talking about the Inflazone project. So um, yeah, it's, it's a good listen. And our strategic funding is delivered through our sort of distinct business units. So these are all our, our granting programs. I mentioned the first, um, our DICER funding, $15.6 million, which is fully committed now. But we've, um, we've, uh, we've funded projects like the Vaxis Clean Rooms in, in the TRI with that, the COSA Teletrials project, um, which, and, and Queensland's great with teletrials, and we've seen obviously a lot of attention on telehealth through COVID, and, um, and in, you know, the, the Queensland Department of Health received about 75 million, I think, to roll out a, a teletrials project around the, around the nation. So that was fantastic news. Um, in, and our other programs are all MRFF funded. So BMTH and BTB are kind of similar, but different. So they're similar in that it's an idea to get someone's innovation through to a, a proof of concept stage. So not a not a traditional proof of concept, but just to make it to jump a hurdle, you know, a value of death, and make it attractive to further to further funding from from VCs or another grant or or something like that. So BTB has an additional kind of a mentoring and training. Um, point to it um, through the, the bridge program and we partner with with the bridge program bridge tech program as well as Unicap quest bio curate and the mdpp as well on btb um, then we've got ready which we're going to talk about a bit more and the ttra which is the targeted translational research accelerator which is focused on diabetes and cardiovascular health that's got a couple of arms to it to set up a a center of excellence, and then to fund projects as part of TTRA as well. So one of the things that we funded out of our $15.6 million DICER funding is, and, and I mentioned the Fighting Superbugs report, was the um, we funded four catalytic bodies. Um, and one was on regenerative medicine, another one was on genomics, cardiovascular, and antimicrobial resistance. So we, we 
established and run the AMR Net, the Australian Antimicrobial Resistance Network, which was a recommendation of this report, Fighting Superbugs, which itself was a report on a round table that we held with broad sector. Were you, were you there, David? I think no, you were. No, you weren't. Oh. Um, anyway, so that, that report, it, it's focused on human health um, we, and the market failure around antimicrobials, um, resulting in the weak pipeline that, that we all know about. There's not enough new antimicrobials coming onto the market to meet the growing resistance, basically. So MTP Connect formed the AAMR net. Um, we have a steering committee and we are very delighted that David is on that steering committee with us. Um, and yeah, it's fantastic. So we needed um, match funding to get this up and running. So we're very grateful to Pfizer, CSIRO, MSD, GSK, Medicines Australia, Botanics, and the Monash Centre to impact AMR to who have provided industry contributions to that network. But I like that. I just had to mention that. I co-chair that network and um, it's a bit of a pet um, sort of love of mine, I guess. <laughs> So yeah, it's good. We were invited to the um, to appear at a parliamentary hearing, for example, recently, which I think is incredible. It's for we we put in a, a submission to that particular inquiry a month after we were formed, and I thought there was no way we'd be invited to hear at a pub, to appear at a public hearing, but um, we did. It's a lot of work, but it's a great opportunity to to talk to the politicians about AMR as an issue. So we'll talk about ready. It's a three pillared program. It's for over four years, 32 million over four years starting last year. So um, the first pillar is an expansion of proven programs that we already um, fund or have funded on a smaller scale in the past. So And Health is uh, um, in the digital health sector. Um, we support um, them to expand some of their programs. GSK um, have programs as well, which we are helping to expand in Pillar 1 of READY. Um, IMNIS, which is the in, uh, Industry Mentoring Network in STEM, um, they, they do um, mentoring for PhD students. Sorry, I haven't got my notes, so I, I stand to be corrected on this now. Um, yeah, but for, for PhD students, MDPP, which is the Medical Device Partnering Program, and, um, and they look after devices and the MedTech actuator. So they're um, our partners in Pillar 1. So Pillar 2 is a comprehensive... So what we did with that is we did a comprehensive skills gap analysis. So that was set out in three ways. hope I'm not getting ahead of myself on my slides here. So, But we've partnered with a, a few different organisations to try and address those skills gaps, basically. And then um, Pillar 3 is about internships and fellowships, um, which we'll talk a bit more about again in a minute. So that, here we go. The, these are the proven programs which I just talked about. Um, they, if you're interested in one of these, and I'd encourage you to look them up, um, you, you contact these organisations directly. Okay, so this is not through 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 MTP Connect. Uh, again, very happy for you if you're interested to call me and contact me, and and we can I can tell you exactly what they are offering. Um, but if you to get involved in them, you need to go straight through the the um, the companies on that slide. So this is the skills gap analysis. As I said, um, they there's three phases. There was the uh, interim skills gap analysis that was uh, that was published last year the idea was to identify sort of urgent skills gaps stuff that that we could say okay this needs to happen it needs to happen now let's put some money into it and um, I think the line is something we could um, we can um, give money to without regret I think is the is the, is the line so so yeah, it was interesting that you know QMS is it was noticed as a as a skills gap, that sort of thing. I think COVID really highlighted things like that with lots and lots of companies pivoting to to get involved and try and help. It's like yeah, okay. So have you heard of the regulatory pathway and the TGA? And and some people hadn't even heard of the TGA, right? So it's it it was definitely a gap. Um, and, and sometimes it's not, not so much a skills gap, but an experience gap as well. 
So, um, so, and that's where the fellowships come in as well, I think. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a, an interesting experience last, last year to, to uncover these gaps. So I think that the, the analyses that we did was, was really useful in, in really digging down into them. And, and that's what the second report does. It, it identifies a lot more skills gaps and, and sort of goes, well, here's the priority ones that we need to start looking at addressing. So, and that, and from that, We've developed, um, we, we've partnered with some organisations to develop uh, programs that to address those gaps. And we've partnered with CF Pharma and the VCCC, the George Institute and ARCS to, um, to develop programs to help address those. And here, here's a couple of them. So CF Pharma are holding um, uh, a they're holding a couple of courses around QMS in um, up here in Brisbane. Um, there's the link there that you can find a bit more about it, um, and the and the ARCS um, courses as well. I think ARCS are Melbourne and Sydney based, but so these courses are heavily. Your if you want to participate in one of these courses, they're heavily subsidised by Ready, so they're not. It's not going to be like a ten thousand dollar you know enrolment fee or anything like that. It's really heavily subsidised by. By, re by ready. So I'd encourage you, if you're interested to learn more about these sorts of things, then then um, check out the, those websites um, because it is, as I say, it's a lot cheaper to to um, through the through the ready subsidy. Okay, so industry internships and fellowships. Here they are. So as I, I mentioned, the VCCC and GSK Bridge and Bridge Tech program. Are, there, there's expansion of that the bridge and bridge tech are offering um, internships to their participants in those programs they're great programs too by the way if, if you if you're not aware of bridge and bridge tech i'd strongly encourage you to apply to be part of those they um i went to a bridge symposium uh, a couple of years ago and just the and, and you know I spoke at the start about the the enthusiasm and, and generosity of, of people in the industry, and that was no more evident than at a bridge symposium that I was at. So, um, for example, that the, they they timed bridge program for Oz Biotech, and they had there was a really senior guy from Amgen over from California. This was in 2019. Um, he he was. Yeah, as I say, really senior. And he was there from first thing Sunday morning to last thing Tuesday night, the whole time of those three days. And he was talking to everyone in that room and there was like a hundred odd, you know, bridge participants. He's so engaged and so giving of his time and, and whatnot. It's it's really, it was brilliant. It was a fantastic symposium. And, and, and as we can hopefully get back to face-to-face -to -face things, I think, you know, that they're really valuable. So Bridge and Bridge Tech, I'm really enthusiastic about, about those. Um, yeah, and, there's, uh, and then there's the fellowships. This is them. So the, the fellow, we've had two fellowships announced so far. So um, they were announced in the federal budget, the May federal budget. Um, there's one uh, in, within Telix, Telix, Telix Pharmaceuticals, and the other one is, I said this before, didn't I? Who's it with? It's in with Brandon Capital is what it is. It's so so the, it, they're, they're generally three to six months. Again, not having my notes, I'm, and I apologise. Um, they're three, generally three to six months. They're placement within industry. So you need willing partners here and, you, and it, it's built on established relationships. Um, yeah, so, but it can be a, like in all different sort of areas of the value chain of, of medical research and manufacturing. So these are the aims of the Ready Fellowships. It's about researcher exchange and development. That's in the title of Ready. So um, research and exchange and development within industry. We're wanting to foster greater understanding between industry and academia to embed high-level commercial and entrepreneurial expertise, increase comp competency and sustain relationships. We know how important collaboration is to get um, a, an, a, um, a product to a patient safely and effectively, and, and so this fosters that, that collaboration and, and those relationships. They're really super important. 
So here are uh, the sort of a bit more detail, I guess. And as I mentioned the willing participants. And so this is really important. So an eligible fellow, I, I, and uh, please check that out on our, on our website, the, the full eligibility, um, an eligible sponsor and a supportive employer. So to be an eligible sponsor, it, we're not looking at startups and small organizations. The idea behind this was to, for someone to go into a company of decent size and work on a project and learn and take that expertise back. And so, and by supportive employer, we mean that the employer has to take you back, right? There's got to be some commitment that it's like, well, you've been gone for a year. No, you know, there's nothing left for, you know, sorry, your job's been filled and it's gone. It's, it, you, you, we, need you, we need you to go back. That's part of the deal. So, so that your, your current employer has to be supportive. Um, so, and I don't think it includes PhD students, at the moment, but again, please check that out. Um, it, so it needs to be a defined project. So if the sponsor or the industry um, that's going to take you on for the for the period of time, six months, a year, whatever it is, they need to have a de defined project for you to come and work on in their in their organisation for that period of time. Um, yeah. So the the grant is up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So this includes basically, it's almost like if, if, if we could travel, for example, you know, it, what a great opportunity would be for someone to go and work at Pfizer's head office in, in Manhattan or, or a Swiss company in, in, in Basel or whatever. So the idea behind the funding was to, to support all of that activity. So relocation, um, expenses around, around that. Um, I think it might have included, you know, supporting your children to go to school and you're, while you're there as well. So, obviously, we haven't got that option at the moment to go to to, to go to New York or or, um, or Switzerland or wherever. So it it's has it's it's still much the same. You know, a, a decent sized company, so at least twenty employees currently. So um, we will support. The, all those relocation expenses, all the, all uh, you know, um, all, all that's required for you to go to that sponsor and and do your do do that defined project, and come back. Oh, here we go. Here's the eligibility. Great, yay! So, <laughs> so researchers, academics, clinicians, other MTP prof professionals, um, uh, early mid career or experienced. Um, employed by an eligible employer and, and with support, as I mentioned. So um, an Australian citizen or permanent resident, and it's in a, in, a, in a field of interest to the sponsor. So this is this is really important. So it is industry led, right? So it's you, uh, any fellow wouldn't be applying to MTP Connect. It's not like a matchmaking kind of thing. Say, oh, you, you'd be great for this company. That's not the way ready fellowships work. It's driven by the sponsor, the sponsor, will do the application through Smarty Grants, uh, our granting pro, um, online program. Um, yeah, so that's the way, that's, that's how it works, driven by industry. And here's an eligible employer, um, university, MRI, hospital, and as I said, willing to take up a fellowship and return to back to the employer. And the sponsor, here we go, medical technology, biotechnology, pharmaceuticals, digital health, specialist best practice. So I mentioned that one of our first fellowships announced was at Brandon Capital. And that, so they are, um, they are obviously a um, business development and, and tech transfer kind of situation. So that's an important part of the whole ecosystem. So, so it, that sort of thing is open um, for an opportunity as well. And the, this is the process. So there's two um, two dates this year for applications: first of July and first of November. The application goes in through Smarty Grants. It's assessed. The contracts award. 
awarded and um, and then away you go. There is a reporting requirement. Like everything, we are expected to report to the Department of Health. So we expect reports from, from our grantees as well. And that reporting goes on after you finish and, and into the next year of when you're back at your employer. So this is... Uh, this is the manufacturing smile curve. I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with this, but you, you know the federal government's very focused on manufacturing out of the October 21, 20, October 2020 budget um, with their modern manufacturing strategy. And the manufacturing smile curve gives you an idea of the value chain of that manufacturing process. So basic research is high value manufacturing. That's how we look at it. It's all part of the manufacturing value chain and the high value stuff is basic research and preclinical research. The actual making things at scale is of lesser value. Obviously, there's different value attached to that through the sovereign capability side of things that we're seeing play out at the moment. But you, when you're looking at a fellowship, it's good to, you can tailor it. So as I said, there's, there's value in sales and marketing. You know, it's post-manufacturing value. It's all part of the, the manufacturing um, value chain. So maybe there's a fellowship there in, in services and market access. You know, there, there's some pretty cool projects that I could think of that would be really valuable to be part of, like, like you know, getting a, getting a TGA submission together or an FDA submission together or something. That would be amazing. Um, and it's all, it's all part of the manufacturing smile curve. So, um, so yeah, so that's that I'd, I'd encourage you to look at that because there is, a, is, is obviously a focus on manufacturing and, and how that fits into how we come out of the COVID pandemic. This is our ready team. Jared is really approachable. So is Michelle. They're both fantastic. Um, Feel free to get in touch with them for details. The, there's, um, the guidelines and whatnot are online on our website as well. So, um, so feel free to check it out. And that's me. I'm all finished. Thank you very much for listening. And I'm, I apologise. I probably didn't give as much detail as I was planning. But <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much, Andrew. And even though it doesn't look like there's many people here, do we know how many 30-something um, online? Because we're a bit of a hybrid at the moment. So I might just start with people who are online. If um, you'd like to sort of go ahead and unmute yourself and ask questions. Sometimes a bit shy. That's right. Because I was sitting back just thinking, oh... Might go to New York City yeah. or <laughs> well, any you know, companies in Paris or Milan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Paris would be good, wouldn't it? Um, it does run for four years, the the Ready program. Mm. So so hopefully we'll be, you know, I think the latest is twenty twenty two, mid twenty twenty two, when we can open the borders, or mm. that's what they're sort of flagging. So um, hopefully there will be that opportunity for um, for people to get to get to go overseas yeah. and, and learn in that, in that environment um, at some point during READY. So and do you have an idea how many fellowships are going to be awarded over yeah. time? I, I don't. No, because that's... I, I, I'm not sure if there is a, a specific number that mm. we attach to it. Okay. But um, and it, it, they're taking applications and everything will be reviewed on a case-by-case -case yeah. basis. And what mm. sort of panel would it assess these? These would be presumably people who are in industry or...? Um... I think it's a bit of a mix. I'm not uh, sure of exactly who's on the panel, but mm -hmm. but looking at how NTP Connect operates and with its other programs, we do generally will we'll get a, an independent um, broad panel who's reflective of, of, of what we're trying to achieve as well. So, um, so and that's that process is, is, is transparent mm -hmm. and um, it has to be, we, 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 you know, we, we are accountable to the government. So, yeah. and we, we do, MTB Connect does pride itself on, on that transparent process. Mm -hmm. We think that's critical for the, for the you know, the governance and, and the credibility of, of our grants. Yeah, fantastic. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, okay. Uh, why don't you ask your question verbally? Um, just of. Sorry, I missed. Who was asking? Oh, that's right. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Erica, ooh. I agree, Erica. It sounds like a dream to me as well. <laughs> we, we'll just have to clarify um, whether PhD students are eligible. I can, I can do that on yeah. my notes if I can. I, I'm pretty sure the PhD students aren't okay. eligible. Erica, do you want to just... Um, okay, Erica's mute. But that sounds fascinating, Erica, what you're up to. Um, other questions? Uh, Richard, do you want to come up to the microphone just so the um, people can... So my question, Andrew, is more about the 250,000, the cash eligibility. Does that change if it's more than six months, a year? Does that... Can it all be... Oh, it's up to two hundred fifty thousand. Yep. So, so it'll be it'll be worked out on a case by case basis. So, it could if it's six months, it'll be worked out how much do we need for six months versus how much do we need for for a year, and and the wages page will reflect how the length of time and everything. Obviously, relocation and things like that will yeah. will will be included. But um, yeah, yeah, it's it's up to. But it's a total budget, not capped per category or something like that. Uh, it's uh, yeah, it's it's capped. It won't go over two hundred and fifty. That's yeah. my understanding of it. Okay, fantastic. Mm -hmm. And can one organisation sponsor more than, say, good question, one candidate? Look, I, given candidate? I, I, um, uh, I would say yes. I like I'm, again, again, it would be a question for Jared. Yeah. But given looking at the way it works with a defined project, you know, you might have a, a global company, obviously they're big, they've got a corporate affairs division and they've got a, you know, a business development division and they've got a sales and marketing division. division. So I think that if you, again, tailoring a fellowship would mean like if, you know, if you've got a relationship with someone in, in, in corporate affairs in, in a company and, and you're interested in policy development and then there could be something there, you know, and that same company might have might have market access people who who want to who are working on a, a a TGA application for their new biologic or something like that. So I don't I don't I hope I'm not talking out of turn here. And, and yeah. Jared's on the phone to me. Going, <laughs> no, don't say <laughs> that. <laughs> um, but I, I don't see I I can't see why that couldn't happen with a company that is big enough and has the capability and has the capacity and the expertise to to be able to do that. So it, it yeah, as I say, we, we're targeting larger companies, and um, and you know obviously a company with twenty employees is probably not going to be that opportunity, but a, a company with thousands of employees, mm. then there, there may be that opportunity for that. Mm. Thank you. Any final questions? Because we're just about on the hour. Um, Andy, I saw your question about whether you can purchase consumables for running a project. Maybe if you look on the eligibility, or not the eligibility, but some of the finer detail and maybe talk to Jared about some specifics. All right, well, we're right on our hour. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was, um, oh, I'm going to be all excited about this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I think on behalf of other people, because I, I think it is a really neat scheme and um, congratulations again to our winners of papers of the month and thank you Julie and your team for adjudicating I think you chose some good ones all right well thank you everybody and um, we'll be back in two weeks just just quickly David, yes I, I found it and yes PhD students are ineligible okay yeah sorry so Erica just stay tuned because it if it's running for a few more years, in two years, you might be um, able to do it. Hokey dokey. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.